Hello everyone, it's Ace Reporter Jeff Bartenstein reporting live from here on the road from Emmaus. Now it's a whole lot like the road to Emmaus except you're going in a different direction. And today not only did my direction in life take an abrupt change, but so did my perspective. I left Jerusalem for Emmaus in one frame of mind expecting to find one thing and then on the way back by the time I arrived and came back my thoughts had taken a complete 180 and I'll tell you it's been a really long day and a lot has happened and it may be easier if I start at the beginning so bear with me and here we go because I think what I have might be life-changing Folks, it's first day of the week. The Sabbath, or what they call the Shabbat, has passed, and people are again free to travel and free to go to and fro. And more importantly, three days have passed since Jesus was executed by crucifixion. Afterwards, he was taken down from the cross. The body was then prepared, wrapped in a burial cloth, and then it was placed inside a tomb. The tomb was owned by one named Joseph of Arimathea. And it was a tomb in which no body had ever been before. His was the first body to ever go there. The tomb was then placed under Roman guard. A very large and heavy stone was rolled in front of the door and it was given the official Roman seal that don't tamper with this. And that's where we left you last time. I'll get to my undercover head dressing here in a minute, okay? Well, the Passover festival was also concluded, and it was time for the visitors to Jerusalem to go back home. There would be plenty discussed to discuss on the journey home, but it would all focus on this Jesus. Everyone was talking about Jesus. Some thought he was a great prophet like Moses, that he was the promised one, and like Moses, he would deliver the people from their suffering in this world, and that through his power and his might that somehow he would overthrow the shackles of Roman oppression, on the once proud uh, tribe and land of Judah. He would then ascend and take over the throne of Caesar, and he and his people would then rule. The Jews would no longer suffer at the hands of their overlords. Jesus' kingdom right here and now would take precedence over all others, physically, in a physical sense. Every knee would bow, every tongue would confess Jesus is Lord, he would then take and wipe every tear from every eye and everyone would be happy all the time. We believed his reign on earth was ready to begin. Well, boy, let me tell you, it didn't quite work out the way we thought it would. And it would take a visit from a perceived, supposed stranger to set things straight and to set us straight, even more importantly. We left Jerusalem this morning for Emmaus. It was a distance of roughly seven miles pretty good walk. Before we could gather our things, we received word from one of Jesus's female followers who came up to us and said, we went to the tomb and we found it empty. Our Lord's burial cloths were carefully wrapped and they were lying inside the tomb, but his body, his precious body was nowhere to be found. So with no body in the tomb, we left. And there near the tomb was a man. And I approached the man and I said, Sir, if you have taken our Lord's body, please tell me where it is so that we may get it and put it back in the tomb. Those were the words of a lady we talked about before, one Mary of Magdala. She didn't stop there. She had more to tell us. She said the man then spoke to her in a familiar voice saying, Mary, Mary. I looked up at him and it was indeed Jesus. I didn't recognize him at first, but it was him. I ran over, I fell to the ground and I wrapped him in my surest embrace. I didn't want to let him go. I didn't want to lose him again. There were others there that confirmed what Mary said. They then said they were told to come and tell the 12 minus Judas what they had seen. Well, I had a full day ahead of me, I tell you, and I had more to do than listen to the delusional gibberish of irrational women. Why had all this happened the way it did? We couldn't figure it out. This was to be Messiah's finest hour. Instead, he suffered the most humiliating of embarrassments, death by Roman-style crucifixion. Me and Cleopas would have time to sort this out on our journey to Emmaus. Soon we were on our way, and as we neared our destination, a stranger happened along our way, and he began to walk with us. He wanted to converse with us, but he had no idea what we were discussing. I thought the man a complete and utter dolt. How could anyone leaving Jerusalem at this time not know the things that have taken place? 
We told him all that had happened, and we caught the man up to speed. Perhaps Cleopas and I, though, were the delusional ones. All our hopes were wrapped up in this man Jesus being the Messiah, even though I was undercover as a reporter. See, here's my headgear I usually wear, so they didn't. They didn't recognize me. So I better maintain my undercoverness here. Beginning back to my story. The poor women in Jerusalem had apparently lost their minds over the incident. Mary said she saw Jesus alive. I suppose the grief and sadness was too much for her, and she succumbed to the illusion. We were all sad and grief-stricken. Things didn't turn out as we had planned, as we had hoped. But back to my story. Our new traveling companion apparently had a wealth of knowledge pertaining to the Jewish Messiah. He began to recite to us the law, the prophets, and the writings pertaining to the Jewish Messiah. We stopped talking, and we began to listen to him very intently. The whole matter made little sense, even though it burned within us. We reached our destination, and the man appeared to be going on. Being late, we invited him in. Once inside, we gathered round the table, but tradition usually was we would break the bread, but the stranger came in, took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and we realized this was no ordinary stranger. This was no stranger that had come along our way. It was Jesus, but before we could say even a word, he had vanished. He was gone from our midst, I'm telling you reporting the truth. This is not fake news. Well, there was only one thing for us to do. I'd planned to take a nap before doing another report, but we had to go all the way back from there seven miles and tell the others. And there was no time to waste. Me and Cleopas walked together for a while, but I decided I was tired and wanted to stay back and decide, besides, I wanted to start writing these thoughts down, you know. There's a reason for that. Get to it in a moment. So he went on ahead and I took a break and took a Kit Kat bar, and I needed it, and a Snickers. I needed, though, to collect my thoughts. I really need to write this down. This might be important someday. I may have actually viewed a piece of history. But you know, in my time, most people are illiterate. They do not read or write, but that is perfectly okay. There's usually no reason for them to. The tribal elders would regularly gather and tell stories. They would tell the history of who they were, and they would share it amongst themselves, and they all knew the stories of Moses, Elijah, King David, and the others. They were passed along for generations in this manner. However, there would come a point when the oral traditions were reduced to writing, and I felt it was my obligation to tell this story and then write it down, the story regarding Jesus. This way it would be preserved for future generation. That's what I'm working on mentally, and here are some of my observations in closing. Mary and the others did not find Jesus in the tomb, and for very good reason. Tombs, graves, crypts, mausoleums, and the such are places for dead people. Jesus was not dead. He was very much alive, I tell you. Alive, alive. His wrappings were inside the tomb, but his body wasn't. Where was Jesus, you ask? He was right there where Mary found him. There in the real world, the living world, the living, breathing world. That place where people carry on their everyday lives. Some are gardeners, like this man she, Mary, thought she saw. Some are builders, scribes, doctors, others are journalists, like me. He longs to meet up with us, Jesus, that is, in the midst of our daily activities, of our triumphs and our struggles. And what had been under wraps since the beginning was revealed, especially to us. Death was no longer humanity's ultimate and final destiny. We knew this for a fact. We had seen Jesus alive for ourselves. Jesus didn't come to take away our pain and suffering in this world. Instead, he came to save us through his. His example of the suffering servant, faithful unto death, was his tale all along. It just wasn't the tale we selfishly wanted to hear. We had our own ideas about how we should be. It was hard for us to let go of our own preconceived notions. We were just like Mary. We wanted to cling to the past. We didn't want to let it go. But once our paths crossed, he doesn't want us, Jesus that is, to re revert back to our old and our primitive, 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 I say, ways of thinking. However old habits, they can be difficult to break. We're not to be controlled solely by circumstance. Circumstance in our surroundings will cause us to lose focus. Don't be controlled by what you see. No, no, no. 
Instead, be controlled by what Jesus the Christ says. When we find ourselves off track and maybe on that road to Emmaus, Emmaus isn't necessarily a physical location, it can be a state of mind. Expect in those times for Jesus to appear. In some way, shape, or form, he'll work his way into our everyday lives. And at the right time, he'll open our eyes and you'll see fireworks like for the very first time. He'll show us where we need to be. And now, in his current form, he can be in all places at all times. No prodigal can journey so far that he can't find them and bring them back home. Fear and reason do not make good companions, I tell you. Fear is the absence of reason. And fear by itself causes all kinds of irrational thought. Unfortunately, fear is often driven by circumstance and by surroundings. You look out and you see how bad the world is. We better not go out today because if we do, we might die. We better stay inside and perhaps never go out again. And yes, there are times when staying put is appropriate. But that season is fast coming to its conclusion, both in my story and in yours there in 2020, America, and wherever you live in the world. The resurrection has been revealed. Jesus is no longer under wraps. It is through his resurrected body that we too shall live. We are to live by faith and not by fear. Let scripture, not circumstance, be our guiding star in life. You know, there's an intersection where faith and reason merge and they come together. And it's there at that point, Christ makes his appearance, our eyes open. He's like the traffic cop guiding us in the right direction. And it's there at that intersection that we'll find our answers. That point where the conflict between what we know and what Christ wants us to know is resolved. That starting point where we begin to walk by faith and not by sight. That seemingly chance meeting with the Christ when our eyes are truly open for the first time. We get glimpses of the truth revealed through his word. And that truth is Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And now, Ace reporter Jeff Bartenstein will go back, remain in my undercover attire so I don't blow my cover. And I'm going to continue writing this story, and I'll try to report more as time goes on. Reporting live from the road coming from Emmaus, Ace reporter Jeff Bartenstein. Now back to our studio.